Good morning, everybody. It's uh, 11.07 a.m. Eastern time this Friday, April 12th, kicking off On the Margin. Special guest this week as, as Mike is out for a wedding, we have Felix Javan. Felix, welcome to the show and, and also Tyler, trusted co-host. Quinn, you sound like an AM radio host from the 70s. <laughs> I'm practicing. It's, if the fun doesn't work, yeah. you know, you, you gotta you gotta always be hedging. Mike, we miss you, buddy. <laughs> Felix, maybe yeah. a couple words on your background. I know you've been on the show before, but uh just so folks are aware. Totally, yeah. Happy to be back here again. Um was on the show a couple months ago and really excited to be back here again. I'm based up here in Canada in the great white north uh, near Vancouver um, and have a very similar background and focus as uh, you, Quinn. So looking at the intersection of macro and crypto is definitely a big passion of mine. Uh, I do a lot of writing, write a newsletter, a uh, whole bunch of variety of things. I'm pretty active on Twitter and just really excited to chat about what's going on. It's been a pretty crazy week for macro and always is a crazy week for crypto. So lots to talk about for sure. Maybe Felix, you want to kick us off with... You know, we have the CPI print, we had PPI yesterday, so a lot of data, we had the Fed minutes, and, you know, a little geopolitical mixed in. What What's kind of moving markets in your mind? And, uh, you know, how are you seeing things? Yeah, totally. So this week, we had both the CPI and the PPI prints come out. And they're quite different. CPI came in hotter than expected, I came in at 0.4% month over month versus the expected 0.3% month over month. Same with core came in at 0.4% versus the expected 0.3% month over month. So overall, we saw that it came in hotter than expected. Um, based on that, paired with a pretty nasty bond auction that occurred in the 10 year, we saw uh, the long end sell off pretty aggressively. Um, and what was really interesting is that the day following we saw is that PPI came out, which is, uh, you know, basically the producer price index. And a lot of that is the, the cost inputs into businesses. And although a lot of that has a, has a lagging effect into how it trickles into CPI. So it's quite interesting that that actually came out uh, cooler than expected. So, um, you know, core PPI came in at uh, pretty much right on the margin, though, at uh, 0.2%. Uh, but core PPI on a year over year basis. Um, came in a bit cooler as well. So overall, that was really interesting to me. And just digging into some of the charts, there's a really interesting one where a lot of that increase um, in the CPI versus the PPI came into how uh, car insurance is calculated. And I'll just share my screen here and show an interesting chart that I saw. As you can see, the way that car insurance is calculated in CPI led to a pretty significant increase in it versus for PPI, it actually came down over that month. And PPI, the way that's calculated, actually trickles better into uh, the, the PCE, which is the, the price index that the Fed mostly watches, which I found really interesting. Um, just curious what you guys think about that. I'm in the camp that the Fed wouldn't have come out and been pretty dovish. Like, and we saw a lot of dovish commentary. It's clear that there's a political reason for them to ease here, uh, not only because of the interest rate expense on all the debt, but you know, Biden's heading into an election year as well. So I, I think this is going to be really interesting to watch geopolitically, you know, the forward looking stuff like oil right now is telling us you know, inflation's out of the bag, right? There's a lot of weird geopolitical things going on. So I'm, I'm curious if they continue to, to be dovish and, and you know, speak about rate cuts here if <laughs> i think if they do they're gonna have to change their their policy mandates like they're gonna have to say we're gonna do nominal gdp targeting or you know lower the the long-term interest on on the debt they'll have to do something funky um to keep to keep the the liquidity going so uh, my read is i guess inflation is definitely here to stay uh i don't see it coming down much more. Um, so that's where I'm at, Quinn. Yeah, I mean, the trend is very clear to me since since the middle of last year when it bottomed. Um, the Some interesting things I found were like today, this morning, the inflation expectations, which Powell always, always highlights in his speeches as still being anchored, you know, maybe coming slightly unanchored uh, by 0.2% uh, on the near term and long term don't want to read into one reading too much, but uh, the other piece is the the percentage of of total components of these the CPI being above two or three or four percent. That's also increasing. So 
I kind of, you know, I, I, on the one hand, I don't look into one report too much, but I also don't buy all these exclusions that change from report to report. One, one week it, or one month, it's X housing, one month, it's X services, one month, it's X oil, one month, it's X car insurance. Like, okay, it went, you know, the trend is, is up and yeah, it, it to me, the, the Fed is like, we always talk about their hand being forced and it, and it seems like they kind of find a way out. I think that may, like the markets can be looking to this, this May 1st Fed meeting is, is a really big date, in my opinion, because the last meeting they told us that we are prioritizing GDP. They said we're raising GDP, or yeah, jobs. They're raising their GDP forecast. They're raising their inflation forecast, stronger economy, but they're going to cut the same amount of times. And, you know, now we're seeing, we're seeing those inflation numbers kind of be a little scarier. And do they, you know, continue to prioritize unemployment or, or try and stop inflation? It, it it's going to be interesting because when you mix in the geopolitical stuff too, you know, and that adding a floor in, in commodities, like nothing is really working their way in, in the same fashion that everything was working their way in 2023. Yeah. That's why we see the VIX is up 25% right now. It's a lot of this stuff is, uh, <laughs> Yeah, the policy vol controllers are have their back to the wall here, and what I, what I think is we're going to get the SPR release pretty soon, and we'll probably get the SLR uh, bank bank numbers, which basically allows banks to you know hold more treasuries after that failed treasury auction. That's what I'm expecting here from the policymakers soon, because I don't think you know they let this thing go any longer. It's gonna it's gonna devolve pretty fast. Why don't Why don't we dive into that? Because the markets all week have been kind of no one, it seems, is is made up their mind. The Nasdaq, you know, the, the long end has been pretty one direction. But even today, right, where the Nasdaq's down big, the long end is is rallying as as maybe a bit of flight to safety with some of the the flare up in the Middle East. Uh, mm-hmm. Let's let's kind of talk about those dynamics of the long end because because I think we all agree that's really driving the market, and it'd be good to break that down further. Totally, yeah. I think I think it's difficult with what's going on with the geopolitical conflict right now in the Middle East. It's 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 really uh, messing up a lot of what's actually occurring in the fundamentals as well at the same time. Because again, what we're seeing today is that classic flight to safety rotation into bonds right now, um, which is muddying the waters a little bit. You know, I don't know about you guys, but for me, whenever I see these geo- geopolitical conflicts arise, we see that the the overreaction comes first. And, you know, like you're saying, Tyler, VIX is up almost 25% today. Um, you know, t- it's, it's hard to have any edge in knowing what's going to actually occur there. But I think when we go one notch deeper on what's actually driving price right now, especially on the long end, is obviously we had the 30-year auction yesterday. We had the 10-year auction the day before. Both of those tailed pretty aggressively. There was obviously notable decrease in demand uh, for the long end in that respect, with uh, you know accelerating inflation and an accelerating economy. Can you, ex- and, yeah. Can you explain the dynamics of that? Just because you know a lot of the auctions people don't get, and kind of where the foreign buyers are, et cetera. Because that yeah, important. totally. So you know when we come to an auction, there's basically two types of buyers. There's uh, non-competitive bids and competitive bids. And the basically combination of that is that there is a set amount of uh, you know dealers that are willing to purchase at, a, at whatever uh, yield the Treasury in Yellen is trying to attempt to uh, issue these bonds at. And then it basically goes through a Dutch auction, where as it, it basically reaches a certain notional amount that they want to issue of debt, uh, total value, um, there's incremental increases in what that level of yield would be that they issue at. And basically they keep going until that gets filled to that value. And depending on where that ends versus where they start of, of, of where they actually want to issue that yield, the difference in there creates this tail, um, which is basically the, the spread and differential between those two. So when you have a longer tail, so on the 10-year auction, we had a three basis point tail. So that tells us that basically the yield had to get high enough to fill that demand which means that there is less demand for those bonds. Um, that's generally a really bad thing. And it can get so bad that if they were to fill up all those bids in the Dutch auction to the point where they wouldn't even be able to fill up that final total notional value amount, that would be a failed auction. Um, when a sovereign has a failed auction, that's really bad news. When the U.S., which is the most solid uh, financial uh, sovereign system in the world, in the reserve currency, if they were to ever have a failed auction, that would be really bad news. Um did the, you know, that did, could basically did Bank of England have one? 
in 22 in October? Or did we not get to that point? I don't think we did. I think there was just a lot of uh, illiquidity in terms of how they're trying to sell those off their own long end bonds. But I don't think it actually had a failed auction. But, you know, that's basically the 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 catalyst or, you know, basically the crossing of the Rubicon moment is if that were to ever occur. So in light of that, there's a lot of these mechanisms that are being discussed of who's going to be buying this marginal debt, because as we see, we have accelerating inflation. So the big idea is, you know, there's plenty of demand for short end uh, T-bills, but the long end, there's a lot of issues. Um, A few of the things that I've been starting to look at that are being discussed, we've had the Treasury buyback program, which has started to roll out recently. A lot of that is uh, focused on trying to improve liquidity in the long end, uh, mostly through purchasing those author on bonds, which is typically the component of that long end that when we see these Treasury markets seize up, that's the ones that are having trouble to be sold versus uh, on their own bonds are a lot easier and more liquid. Um, The other component I saw is that uh, updates on quantitative tightening program. Uh, We had the Fed minutes come out this week, too. God, there's a lot that happened this week in macro. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) But uh, those minutes came out and they were beginning to discuss what a QT taper would look like. Um, They mentioned that they were going to cut in half the amount of treasuries that they're going to let roll off the balance sheet, but uh, keep MBS consistent. And then finally, there's been talk about the SLR exemption uh, potentially coming back into play, which would allow commercial banks to effectively, uh, when you simplify it, they become uh, much larger marginal bidders of uh, U.S. long-term treasuries. So a lot there, curious on what you guys think. And basically the big question is who's going to buy all this debt? Because like we're seeing in the auctions, there's less and less demand right now. Hello, hello, listeners of On The Margin. I've got good news for those of you who are in the crypto scene. BlockWorks is bringing back Permissionless. We're going to be doing Permissionless 3, and this year we are heading west. So we're moving that out to Salt Lake City. That's going to be October 9th through 11th this year. We've got a phenomenal lineup of speakers for you. So we've got Balaji headlining. We've got Sriram, Munib, Matt Hogan of Bitwise, Jan Van Eck. This one's going to be a blast, guys. And I saw many of you out in London for a DAS this year, and I hope to see you out in Salt Lake for permissionless. And because y'all are such faithful listeners, we've got, if you use code MARGIN10, you're going to get 10% off your tickets. Appreciate you all. Hope to see you out there. Yeah, so you post, you know, this was kind of interesting, but the yen was massively weaker, kind of broke out. um, And that's led to a lot of this dollar uh, strength here. How does that do you, because the foreign bidder is basically dropped, right? So that, mm-hmm. so, so are a lot of the, the Japanese buyers that used to buy this, they're not buying anymore. Right. And can you explain that dynamic? Yeah, totally. So um, basically due to interest rate differentials and currencies, there's been a pretty consistent bid for uh, us treasuries, which have had uh, one of the most consistently, you know, basically highest yields on sovereign debt. So, um, that's been consistently occurring where we've seen this pretty consistent bid in uh, in foreigns buying U.S. debt. But yeah, to that point, in these auctions, we've seen that percentage of foreign buyers pretty consistently decrease. Um, there's also been a lot of debate about whether these foreigners are outright selling their treasuries. Um, there's been a few charts that I've seen over the years, especially for China, about whether they're uh, selling off their U.S. treasuries at the same time as well. It's it's a little difficult to see that because a lot of those charts are in dollar value of the bond balance sheet. And with interest rates up, the, the value of the bonds have been coming down, obviously. Um, and it gets a bit more nebulous to, to track the number of bonds on there and if they're decreasing. But overall, what we're seeing is that there's less and less uh, participants from the foreign market showing up and, and purchasing these bonds uh, overall. Yeah. So just to, just to highlight the two biggest problems I think facing or, or two of them is really the total debt burden, which everybody knows with fiscal deficits ramping uncontrollably and, and unlikely to slow down with, with the two presidential candidates we have. You know, there's that stat like a trillion dollars every hundred days. And then uh, Bamel had a good a good chart here that showed the interest payment scenarios under under different rate projections. So assuming Fed cuts, uh, assuming rates stable, and and what that means for the annual interest payment. Which again, when you're already running massive fiscal deficits and, and your interest burden increases by half a trillion a year, that that's just additional debt you have to issue. So obviously, there's a lot of a lot at play with commodities being strong. Uh, you know, that's putting an underlying uh, floor on inflation and, and all these factors. Um, yeah, the, the, it seems to me that 
the the Fed will have a very difficult time cutting rates when inflation, like mm-hmm. like something needs to change in in a bad way economically. Like unemployment needs to go above four, which which isn't great. But none of their problems are fixed, and I think you know we were chatting a little about this before is whether they do QE or not, someone's doing QE for them mm-hmm. and, and it might be the regionals. And we saw that this week when the regionals got taken to the cleaners uh, all week. And Tyler, I'd be curious your, your thoughts there. Yeah. I mean, and just stepping back from like a 20,000 foot view, it, it, it feels to me like we are in this denouement, French word, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, that um, is French. <laughs> yeah, there you go. A demo of, of banking. Like JP Morgan hit 200 bucks and is down 5% today on earnings. I mean, I don't want to go out there and call tops, but you could probably make the argument that that's a top in JP Morgan. Like maybe an all time top. I, I don't know. Like, unless you have like hyperinflation or something. But I guess my point is relatively, Bitcoin has just been just steady as can be here. And Mm -hmm. so like, what would you rather be in a regional bank that has all this commercial real estate exposure or Bitcoin whose volatility is like not, you know, it's, it's dropping. And in fact, this week, you know, it was just bouncing in a really tight range. It almost feels like it's getting set up to make a big move here. Um, So, uh, you know, less, less on the banking, but more just stepping back. What is global collateral here? You know, we're seeing gold rise. It's clear that like, you know, China has been buying gold and these mm-hmm. two, you know, these two systems, one backed by gold, one backed by Bitcoin is kind of emerging. That's what I, I feel. And uh, the banking system has some major issues on their hands. You know, how much more can you grow as JP Morgan? Like you need to be lending to bigger and bigger businesses. You know, the incremental retail customer, I don't think moves the needle anymore unless you just get this giant fiscal push to, to the labor pool. Right. So Mm -hmm. I I think these are just the 20,000 foot problems here and people are waking up to it slowly. Like, you know, if you own, if you're a baby booner and and own treasuries and you're like, why, you know, if inflation's going up, why am I in bonds? Like they're going to start asking their RIA Mm -hmm. that why, why is my bond portfolio falling? You know, that's supposed to be the safe yield. It yeah. is wild to think about how how core of a you know allocation that is for for retirees and and people later. Like I talked yeah. to my parents, and then you know you're supposed to have your like, age, right? Right. It's like it's the target date portfolios, the sixty forty, and then it becomes fifty fifty, and then forty sixty, mm-hmm. and yeah. and just the decimation of that is is not a good direction. But I kind of think you know Bitcoin's resilience on the CPI day to me. I mean, it's one day, can't read into anything too much, but it, it, it told me that when you see, you know, when you see yield rising and, and tightening financial conditions in like a, a medium to tempered way, that's not great. Cause you know, cause the fed can, can, uh, hike rates and respond to that. I think there's kind of this smile going on with us treasuries where like in similar to the dollar smile where it's like, okay, if treasuries are yields are falling by 400 basis points, that means the Fed is adding a ton of liquidity and, and artificially, you know, monetary easing, or if they're r- raising rapidly rising by hundreds of basis points or huge moves in, in the similar way, it means we're closer to that liquidity. And like Bitcoin has just been conditioned now after all these events, when you have regional banks falling 5% in <laughs> one day, like two more days of that, and, and there's going to be action and, and that's going to benefit it. So I think that's, that's this, tug of war right now between it's like how soon will the fed come in and provide that liquidity what's it got to take what's got to break for that to happen and like felix you pointed out this at the beginning of of fading these geopolitical moves a little bit and i kind of agree where like a day like today you have yields you know falling as people fly to safety a little bit but then oil up two percent and yeah so the second that that the you know, conflicts kind of quiet down, like we're back to the, to the problem again for, for yeah. the Fed. And and what I find so funny is that, you know, even just throughout this whole discussion and, you know, if you, if you just 
told me everything we've talked about and that throughout this past year, uh, Fed rate cut expectations have gone from six to almost like one at this point. I'd tell you that, you know, the SPX must be down at least 10% year to date, but it's not. It's up a lot. And, you know, it's it's because I think we're really underweighting the fiscal situation because it's this hiding, you know, basically in the background churn of deficit financing that is sending everything higher. You know, I, I think that's a lot of the reason why so many people have missed misplayed the last two years and I've been expecting this recession is because we've been focused too much on the monetary while the fiscal just keeps churning and burning. And it doesn't matter who gets elected in November, the fiscal deficit's just going to increase. So when you have that dynamic at play, you know, we're talking about these small changes, but overall there's this engine hiding underneath that is just powering these assets higher. And I just don't see that ending. So to me, that's, that's really, um, you know, basically ratified when I look at something like Bitcoin, which is a really pure, purely traded asset that it's it's reflecting that more accurately. Uh, on that point, I don't know if you guys watched the Lynn Alden, Luke Groman uh, on the margin this week, but the yeah. end of it, Mike asked this question. He said, what's going to come first, a recession or, you know, 5% inflation or, or so, something along those lines? And, you know, both of them said in, inflation and Lynn specifically said, What's going to happen, though, is you're going to have recessions in certain sectors mm -hmm. and, and not in others, which is this is my call, my read through on this. And I, I feel very strongly about this. And I hope this goes viral because I, if that occurs where you have recession in some some sectors of the economy and not others, active management will come back in like a huge way because yeah. – this that disrupts, and I'll tell you a story. I worked at Franklin Templeton for years, which is you know giant trillion dollar asset management manager. And there's this guy named Ed Perks. He runs a hundred billion dollars, and I used to trade for him. And for for this whole period of like quantitative easing, and they had no inflation, and like tech was going bonkers. I was like, Ed, how the hell the heck can they, can they do this? And and he basically said, you know, it all ends in inflation. And I think that's here right now. And essentially what he was saying is, you know, passive was eating our lunch at Franklin Templeton because they were undercutting fees. There was no inflation and you could just pile into innovation and growth stuff. You know, Franklin's known as like a value shop. But when inflation comes back, that's when active management really takes on. And like, I think that's what he was saying. This guy's like absolutely brilliant. And, um, but I think that's what's really happening here is you're going to have a recession in a lot of industries that had really cheap cost of capital that shouldn't have because of passive. And you're going to have like, look at, look at industrials because of the fiscal situation, you know, they're going haywire. They're like making all time highs. Um, certain sectors are going to win. Certain sectors are going to lose. So it's really hard to like call that, um, that big credit crisis is, is hard to call. Because it might happen in commercial real estate and not actually funnel its way through because of the fiscal. Um, yeah, and, and not actually hit the consumer. Everyone wants to call that 08 repeat, but it, it, it they always look different. I think you make yeah. a good point there, Tyler, is what we've seen, like we haven't really had a recession since 08. Like, it wasn't uh, even we had a full of steroids, right? Right, <laughs> exactly. So yeah. like, it's, it's, we are in a, we've, like the ball, the snowball has rolled rolled, rolled to the point where it is politically unfathomable at all whatsoever. No questions asked to, ha to have a recession while you're, you're in leadership. Like, yeah. And, and that's just the fact of the matter. And so, and then the policy tools to, to address that are these blunt shovels of monetary and fiscal policy, you know, mm -hmm. trying to stomp out weak growth or stomp out inflation. And it's creating these pockets of, you know, it's like, it, it's the problem doesn't go away. It just reemerges somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. T to that point, you know, it's, this is, this was an argument for like 10 years was low rates, inflationary, or deflationary. And I guess we got the answer, which is on the monetary policy side, it, it, it actually helps anything with leverage, like banks and commercial real estate and housing, yada, yada, yada. Rich people. <laughs> it, it, it's just, it's yeah, people with capital, right? And then this is the capital la to labor cycle. And now that the fiscal is taking over, you know, the interest rates have to adjust. So anyone who, who use a lot of leverage is really going to get smoked here if they bought at, you know, a, a really 
you know, high price essentially. So yeah. all this stuff is, is kind of unwinding. And, but the interesting thing is if you look at implied correlation, which is like, you know, if you have a correlation of one, everything goes up together, everything goes down together, mm-hmm. right? Implied correlation is actually like close to the lows. It's come off, you know, it's up 18% today, but this is, it's still off of like, you know, 10 year lows. I mean, actually all time lows. So if that implied correlation stays low and this is massively rotational where like money goes into mining, money goes into metals, money goes into industrials and comes out of like the high flying tech stuff that's overvalued. Like that, this could be rotational and not that big blow up credit event is, is what I'm saying. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think a lot of us really underestimate the fact that the government can almost choose what GDP it wants. Like if we think back to the equation of GDP, it's consumer spending, it's investment, it's government and spending, and it's net exports. The government can increase government spending in a you know, Keynesian way and increase GDP. Um, mm-hmm. But that's not going to be an efficient use, obviously. And the, the downside risk is they create too much inflation. But that makes a lot of sense for your thesis of seeing these uh, recessions in some sectors, but a booming CapEx boom in uh, sectors that are close to that government spending program. So you see, mm-hmm. I think, a huge bifurcation occurring. And, you know, obviously the cost of that is potential inflation. But if, if they want a 5% nominal GDP, they can get it if they want. They just got to increase that, that G function. Yeah couple charts uh, while we're on it. I think everybody, if you've logged into Twitter in the last week, you've seen these on gold, but kind of highlighting the the uh, collapse in, in correlations between real rates and gold. And then the one of ETF outflows from like GLD and IAU, but but the gold price still still rocketing up. So what, what do you guys make of, if you have any strong opinions on either of these, um, as it relates to gold and, and what it's sniffing out. I got, I got a good reference here. There's a, there's a, I think a chapter in the sovereign individual where it's like when dollars and gold go up together, there's usually a sign there's something, there's a liquidity problem in the plumbing. And I think that's, what's really going on. And my read is if you look at the Asian dollar index, the Bloomberg Asian dollar index, it's getting annihilated here. And I think this is, we're looking possibly at like a 1998 Asian financial crisis situation because, you know, dollars and dollars and gold going up is, is a sign there's, you know, there, there's issues in credit somewhere. And that's, you know, I think that's the big boogeyman is like, if that turns into a geopolitical issue, um, and all these like, you know, this Chinese real estate bubble really implodes in a bad way. And then it turns into kinetic war. Then we got to be really worried and like, because the policymakers, the vol controllers here aren't going to be able to control the vol as much. Um, so that's one real tail, tail risk here. So that's my read on, on dollars and gold going up together. Yeah, I think the scary part is that Tyler is right. And this has been largely Asia driven. And, you know, I think we... Over here in, in the Americas, we like to think that, oh, people are rationally buying gold because they're scared of the fiscal deficit situation. But I don't think that rotation has really started yet. I mean, if you look at, again, GLD flows, there's been consistent outflows from GLD over the past few months. The Americas aren't really buying gold. And, you know, we talk about um, being worried about the fiscal situation, but the everyday person has not reached that level quite yet. So we have this interesting dynamic where there's totally agree there's that potential uh, 98 uh, Asian financial crisis brewing right now. Um, and that's leading to gold outperformance. And then we could get the one two punch of of the fiscal uh, basically debt spiral potentially occurring too. that could uh, really bring it to the next level as well. But I don't think that started yet. That's what I think is interesting here is is one. Uh, I, I talked about I was talking about gold in late 22, early 23 a lot and, and it, like the difference in sentiment uh, from then when it was like in the gutter and you know, it's, it's moved like crazy, right? It, it, that's how it always works. But, but you know, you would get even from crypto people just kind of, uh, nudged away, like for talking about gold. And even now crypto people are like, you know, when it works in your favor, Oh, like Bitcoin should be bid cause gold's bid, but it just has all these things working and it's got the fiscal side at the U S it's, which might be more of a narrative than in, you know, in, in action right now, it's got, 
the Asian currency is looking like they're going to fall off a cliff versus, versus every other global currency. And then you mix in these geopolitical, you know, little kind of hot spots, and it, it makes for just this explosive action. I kind of wonder though, I mean, if, if commodities rise enough and rates start moving enough and the yield curve starts inverting, I, I would imagine gold wouldn't be spared. Like eventually if, if these liquidity things get big enough, we, we saw that on, um, was it CPI day this week, where it felt a little bit like sell what you can, sell what's, sell what's green. Um, you know, where, where, uh, with regionals down 5%, you would expect your gold to be up, but yeah, it seems to be, you know, with that huge, huge breakout out of like a multi-year trend, it, like even if it does cool off, like, I don't know how much uh, a reversal it's going to be doing. Yeah, it could consolidate here for a little while, but I think longer longer term, you know, the energy is like what was it four percent of the S and P, mm-hmm. and you know there was a great you know everyone knows the commodities versus Nasdaq chart or commodities versus equities chart, and that's just starting to come out of like this long term pattern, and I think people are so under allocated to this, which is part of the reason why active management will probably come back here. Is, they're, you know, active management sets the, uh, the price of things, right? And they're still in these funds of, of natural resources and mining and gold. It's the passive has not been there. And I think that shift from passive to like this mining, natural resource, metals, that's, that's going to be happening here probably for decades, you know, with this fiscal push. Yeah, let's on the, in, in diving in on the the Asian currency thing because I think there's more to talk about there. Uh, obviously, we we've had these huge moves and and the the weird thing of of the dollar going up with gold together. So, I think maybe just to frame the background on, on Japan, you know, we know they're they've been behind kind of the rest of the world and coming out of QE. Just just recently, they've uh, flipped to slightly positive short term interest rates. Uh, from from being negative for for many years, and uh, you know the the market has kind of been expecting even I would say the opposite reaction in the yen, which is finally they're going to in- raise interest rates. Inflation is hotter there, uh, but they kind of keep surprising to the dovish side, where where um, slower interest hikes, uh, slower balance sheet runoff, things like that, and and we're seeing the yen break out. So, what do you guys make of that? Because on the one hand, if 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 there was a lot of selling of U.S. Treasuries by the Japanese to repatriate those dollars into the yen, you would see strength in the yen. Uh, but we're kind of seeing the opposite. Maybe maybe it's because the inflation and commodities story is overpowering, or the market saying you're not hiking quick enough. W- where do you guys land on that? I think just one note around sentiment that I find really funny, and we've talked about this previously, but um, again, for years, we've been talking about what would happen to Japan if they reverse out of their yield curve control regime, and that's occurred. And to your point, they have surprised to the dovish side multiple times, but if we just look at absolute changes, we've gone from negative interest rates to you know the, the two-year JGB yield I was just looking at earlier, it's gone from negative 30 basis points to positive 30 basis points. So we've seen seen a change um, overall. But to that point, there's been a lot of people talking about this finally occurring. And now that it actually is, almost nobody's talking about it. Like Japan is no longer doing yield curve control. This has been something that macro folks have been talking about for years and it's happening and and nobody's really talking about it. And to your point, the yen, <laughs> the yen's breaking out in, in the opposite direction. And for me, I think a lot of what's occurring right now is we're just seeing... Um, basically changes in uh, interest rate differentials driven from just absolute dominance of the U.S. economy. Um, so it's, it's, I think it's a little bit less of a story around uh, weaker economies and emerging markets. They are you know, weaker relative to the U.S., but I think it's just absolute uh, GDP outperformance and dominance from the U.S. is making these currencies weaker because a lot of them, you know, here in Canada, um, the Bank of Canada is going to cut in June, most likely. That's what they're hinting at. So we're going to see a cut here in June while the Fed is, uh, you know, now we're seeing basically like a 75% chance of, of a no cut in June, which um, is definitely different from a month ago. So there's a lot of differentials at play, which is uh, creating these changes in uh, currencies that are basically overpowering some of these dynamics, like the fact that yield curve control has reversed in Japan. Yeah, I, I, I think 
to me, the other thing I've been watching is Japan 10 year and 30 year. And, and I can't remember where I heard this, but it was a while back to, to kind of watch the, the 30, 10 year spread in Japan in particular, because the 10 is where they, they kind of stop their, their intervention. And that mm-hmm. spread is an indication of, of the stress on the Japanese central bank to ultimately have to, have to be more aggressive on their, on their tightening. But that's it. I mean, like you said, Felix, it's, it's another problem that's quite severe for, for, uh, us treasury yields with, with the, you know, more pressure coming on the BOJ because it's like, all right, you, you, the Japan save your currency or save your bond market. And, you know, you'd imagine, I think some level of weakness in the yen is, is good. Stocks over there have been really obviously doing well and liking it. If that goes too far, it's, it's probably not great. And then you get more hawkish action and more pressure on U.S. bond yields. So I'm curious how that plays out. And, and ultimately, these things you know, do affect domestic markets here. And, and, and China's a big player and, and knock on there. But it, it's you know what? nice here. <laughs> How, this is another perspective, and this is all the geopol- geopolitical uh, people talk about this, but how much of the yen weakness is just uh, a political decision to really hurt China backing Russia in the war? Because, you know, yeah. as as the yen gets really weak, you know, the dollar gets strong and then the dollar liquidity kind of like really chokes China's ability to uh, tap the capital markets. And then, you know, the only reason China has been able to re- you know, keep keep things going is because the trade balance, they're basically exporting so much to the US to get dollars back in their system. Now, this this is this chart right here is the yen. And that's really forcing when you're an exporting country like like Japan, it forces the yuan also to to weaken and the Korean yuan as well. So like all these Asian exporting nations are basically pegged to one another in, in a, in a manner. And that's, what's really causing this, this dollar strength. You know, we'll see, I, I'm, I'm of the view, if it goes too far too fast, you know, you're going to have a, a Shanghai accord or a Bretton Woods type agreement. We're probably getting closer to something like that. Um, you know, we saw Biden meeting and, and yelling, drinking a beer in a Chinese pub, like who knows what really happened there, but you know, I'm I, I'm suspicious, and you know they're trying to keep this thing together, especially before the election, and who, they're probably giving concessions behind closed doors. But I guess my my point is is that I, I think this vol right here here in the market, and sorry, you're getting faded right now, but the VIX almost went into inversion, <laughs> which is when the front month VIX uh, exceeds mm-hmm. the price of the three month VIX, which is usually a contraindicator. And now oil is selling off, and gold too, but. I think there's going to be some sort of behind closed doors, like let's calm this down here uh, because no one wants volatility in currencies or bond yields at the end of the day. It it causes like really perverse incentives for everybody. My my operating base case has been, okay, so China has been weaker, you know, in the last year plus than than most uh, global economies. Obviously it's, it's heavily talked about their stock market got smoked going into last year into early this year. And I, you know, they're, my gut is that they are trying to eat, they want to ease. They've been easing for, for quite some time with different measures, fiscally and monetarily, but, but if still kept it pretty tempered, like if they really wanted to gas it, you, you feel like they could, right? She doesn't need to as much. He, he doesn't really deal with elections like we do here. Uh, so my feeling is he's strategically been probably waiting to really floor the, the easing until there's more cover from it, right? If they, if they really want to stimulate the economy, they would just, it would smoke their, their currency. So it feels like they're waiting for some air cover here from say the fed and other European Japanese central banks to, to be more dovish. feels like, you know, Japan is being a bit more dovish uh, to, to start easing more. So their currency doesn't fall out. And there's, there's some intricacies there that I'm not sure how to, how, how plays out quite yet. Yeah, I think that's a really important framework is that basically every other economy except for the U.S. is just, you know, basically crossing their fingers and hoping that they can start easing soon. But they have to wait a little bit until the, the Fed hopefully starts and longer, to ease a little and bit. Wait longer. Yeah. And, and to that point, I mean, 
shout out to our to our boy uh, Brett Johnson and the dollar milk milk theory. I mean, I, I bet you could just chart on the DXY 105, and and when that level gets above it, all of Fintwit starts talking about the milkshake theory again. But I mean, is that what we're seeing here right now? Is that every other economy is just really desperate to ease um, for a variety of reasons? And meanwhile, you know, the U.S. doesn't really have to do anything. They're the cleanest, dirty shirt, and they can just hold steady here. It is. It is an interesting. <sighs> Yeah, yeah, it's it's really interesting. I mean, eventually, the, you you imagine eventually, like the the it catches up the fiscal spending, right? Because everyone kind of agrees most of this economic strength is is government fiscally driven, and you would think it, it wouldn't allow them to be so outsizedly strong here, but you, it, it's continuing to work. You you guys are bond guys, but here's here's where like I go back to the Zervos thing, which is like. The fact that the two to ten year curve is not steepening is is a sign in Fed confidence, and that's actually like I keep going back and forth. Like, is everyone losing faith in the Fed, or is everyone not? And if you look at the twos tens, and like you know today LQD, you know corporate bond markets pretty flat, along with high yield. And there's a, there's been a little bit of credit stress, like the high yield CDS broke through its fifty day average. You know, it's something to watch, but like. All in all, things are pretty steady here in the U.S. Like this feels uh, with all the the fiscal, you know, I, I think Luke, Luke Groman's a little bit um, draconian in terms of like this, you know, fiscal debt spiral type thing mm -hmm. because the two to ten curve is not steepening yet. And there's there's been no real like super credit crisis besides like commercial real estate in the U.S. specifically. So I don't know. It kind of serves us geopolitically to have this dollar liquidity like choking off uh china etc we're we're kind of in a, a good place and mm -hmm. it's you know you know what else is fascinating is like check out mexican uh the mexican peso it is it's up like 36 percent. it's it's actually been the biggest beneficiary since covid which is showing thesis right it's crazy so like you know, all the Asian ex exporting countries are getting annihilated. If you look at Mexico or like, you know, not Brazil, but um, Argentina, all these other countries, they're actually like getting stronger currencies. So the, the whole trade routes are just just rewiring here. So what was Yellen, what was Yellen, in your opinion, trying to get accomplished in her visit to China? Is it is it buy my treasury bonds and, you know, calm the the interest rate rise over here like is it you know she talks a lot about china potentially flooding flooding the goods market in in certain sectors whether it's batteries electric vehicles solar cuz th those seem to me like conflicting things on the one hand it's like sh her her speech about china you know they're they're no longer the smaller size they were they're large largest kind of exporter and if they just flood the market with these goods it's going to you know, really hurt global competition, which is deflationary in the short run versus, uh, you know, the, the buying U.S. bonds. And, and, you know, I don't know how they buy U.S. bonds without hurting their currency. You know, th those are kind of two conflicting things. Yeah, I don't, I don't I, All I know is that, like, China definitely undercuts on price and incentivizing certain sectors. It's like, a, you know, the cartel, what a cartel would do to, to you know, maintain a monopoly. And I, I think that's probably what they were, they need competitive markets in the U.S. Like Tesla's toast if, if they start selling cars at $10,000 pop. And that's our innovation. So it was probably had something to do with that. Um, and maybe it's like, hey, we're gonna we're gonna keep tightening here, or, uh, and cause a credit crisis over in China. There's, there's, I'm sure that stuff happens behind closed doors, um, but they do seem to like Yellen better than a lot of our other diplomats. And at the end of the day, there's a ma you know, there's a massive trade uh, going back and forth between the U.S. and China, and you can't just rip that bandaid off without causing like global world war. So these things are very intricate. I think uh, just tying two things together, we've been talking about circling back to the two tens curve uh, and a re-steepening. In my opinion, it re-steepens from the long end going higher than the short end coming lower. Um, in my opinion, the 10 year is, you know, the fair value is 5%. 
at, at this level of uh, GDP performance. And so the issue is, is that, you know, the last time we touched that 5% level, a whole lot of stuff started to break. Um, so there's this interesting tight walk of trying to basically issue more in the long end, and, but also trying to make sure that there's those marginal buyers, you know, circling back to what we discussed with the auctions is that if foreign participation is coming down, that's a big issue. Um, you know, so I could see there being a discussion loosely that uh, the long end's going higher, but we also want to make sure that there's those marginal bidders because the last thing we want is a failed treasury auction. Um, that, you know, that's, that's what I was case scenario. Yeah, I'm kind of. That's why I just think it's such an interesting time for the U.S. bond market. Is I just see like all these you know hopes and dreams, and and every everybody's hands tied. It's like what can we you know Asia, China, and Japan. They can't buy these bonds, not because they want to cause havoc. Their currencies are are falling through the floor, and that that would weaken it even more versus the dollar if they're buying mm -hmm. dollars to buy U.S. bonds. And then you have both of their you know currencies weakening. You have the geopolitical stuff. You have the oil stuff, uh, and then you have the fiscal deficits. And you know every hundred days, another trillion dollars. So it's like we can talk about what we want to do, but. Ultimately, like one of the things I said at the beginning of the year was as a prediction when everybody was calling for all these rate cuts was I said, it's kind of a like very, you know, basic thesis, but I said, you know, optically the Fed will have a very hard time cutting rates because that's all everybody talks about, even though it's less impactful than balance sheet things, right? BTFP, mm -hmm. you know, October, 2022, uh, October, 2023, all these situations weren't uh, improved by rate cuts. It was balance sheet, liquidity, fiscal things. So, my prediction was that they would they would restart QE and QT before they cut rates uh, in in twenty twenty four, which I kind of think still plays out. And and whether you know there just might be nuance because they might not do QE, but they might force upon the banks or or some other yeah. mechanism. That's what I think is going to happen. I think to your point. Everybody knows the game about interest rate hikes and cuts. And now everybody knows the game about QE. Um, you know, 2020 really popularized that QE equals money printer go burr. Um, but only only us nerds and know really a, a lot about like the SLR exemption. And so, you know, QE through the commercial banks, I think is entirely plausible. Um, I definitely think we see tweaks to that uh, ruling in the next few months. Um, you know, we've already started to see some uh, thought leadership papers from you know, I think it was the ISDA that put out a paper saying we should permanently uh, exempt treasuries from the SLR rule. So, you know, the the window is starting to shift towards that for sure. And I think I think we see that over outright QE. Um, and again, I think that is a lot more impactful for markets than just a 25 bips cut. Yeah. And then uh, we have about 10 or 15 minutes to go. M maybe we should uh, loop this back in, into the crypto markets. I think it's been fairly interesting, you know, one, some of the dispersion in there where Bitcoin has really, really, uh, you know, separated itself from, from a lot of the altcoins and other assets with, with Bitcoin dominance making a run at highs again. And, and if you look at these uh, performance charts, really, really outpacing or at least keeping steady while most other assets in the crypto space kind of, kind of falter. Um, and then obviously looping in these macro topics we discussed with rates and, and gold and and currencies. Uh, anything in particular you guys make of of the price action in Bitcoin and, and other assets here, or and, and what are you kind of looking for as we, as we move forward in, in these macro events? I think you know I, I kind of like the relative action of, of Bitcoin in particular. Um, it, you know, it, all the gold bugs are going to say, "Oh, gold's outperforming in this short time span," but. Bitcoin to me is feels very solid. It's it's setting up. If you look at the MACD of Bitcoin, it's actually you know turning up right here, and you you have one thing on Monday that I I'm very curious about, which is Hong Kong um, Bitcoin ETFs go into effect, mm -hmm. and I, I I think that might be kind of interesting, given the given the Asian dollar problems going on. Is like okay, they're finally letting them buy Bitcoin over there uh, legally. And maybe it's this turns into like this geopolitical race for a uh, store of value because <laughs> I don't know if you could also do, zoom out for like the last month or so. Bitcoin's been consolidating, and you know, 
it's been in this kind of uh, bull bull flag type uh, technical pattern. So if you get, I, I think you might get a rollover in the dollar. Here's my prediction for next week: rollover in the dollar. Um, Bitcoin breaks out to new highs. Oil sells off, and uh, gold sells off. Because if you look at the volatility uh, profiles of these things, they're very like the call skew for gold, especially, is mm-hmm. it's really steep. Like they're paying up for calls in gold right now, and and oil, uh, the vol on oil kind of spiked here too. So I don't know. I'm I'm kind of in the if there's no like crazy thing that happens in Israel or any geopolitical like super spike in geopolitical vol, I, I think you know, Bitcoin's pretty close to breaking out here. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. I I yeah. totally agree with most of that. I think um on the geopolitical standpoint, it's uh you know even so, if Iran you guys disagree with me. You guys start disagreeing with me. <laughs> that makes sense. You're, you're Canadian. Um, I'm, too, I'm too polite. I'll just say sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but but no, I mean, if if you look at like what typically happens during these uh, price movements during ge- geopolitical moments, is that if Iran actually did invade Israel or something, that's where you want to be fading anyway. Um, you know, you look at what happened to like the wheat price when uh, when Russia invaded Ukraine. The day they invaded, it's just been down lonely ever since. So um, I'm definitely one to fade these sort of movements. And I think a lot of that price creation has already occurred into the geopolitical premium. Um, so totally agree with that, that next point. Um, I think over higher time frames, especially around Bitcoin right now, um, something that got talked about last week but has sort of uh, slowed down because it hasn't occurred yet is the 13f filings for the spot etf um it's a really interesting moment when you compare it to last cycle where uh, we were right around the all-time highs and then paul tudor jones came out with his uh, fastest horse idea for bitcoin and that just you know that paired with what elon musk was doing uh with tesla and bitcoin just sent us past uh, all-time high and we doubled from there so you know, it's going to be really interesting to see who's been buying the spot ETF um, and whether there's going to be some of those, uh, you know, opinion leaders that have, have been bidding like that and, and what that could be as a, as a catalyst higher, uh, I think is definitely something that nobody's really talking about right now. I find, I find that take uh, both of those interesting. Tyler, on your point, so you're, you're saying that, you know, things kind of calm, maybe, maybe liquidity, you know, comes back a little bit in the market. In your case, you would probably see risk asset, like you know, stock strength. I would guess if 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 you know, gold pulls back, if if oil pulls back, if if we see some calming in these geopolitical fears, and I guess rates TBD, like maybe rates, you know, they've they've been going pretty strong here. They pulled back hard today. Maybe maybe they just stay flattish or inch up slower. Um, it seems like the yeah, go ahead. I think you're more likely just these how these CTAs function is like you, know, you got a big spike in in rates, and yeah. I bet you a lot of people in the short. This is, I'm talking about the short term, you know, yeah, long term. Yeah. You know, right. I still think that you know commodity inflation, et cetera, stays, but like short term, you know, people get short these things, and then it comes and gets smashed down to short cover. CTAs start buying, and it has a self-reflexive event. That's sort of what I was saying there. But, you know, one interesting thing, it, it, there's this ticker, you know, this, I'm, not, I'm not recommending this, but just watching it, FNGU, it's a three times levered like FANG ETF. <laughs> if you look at this, like it, it just broke out yesterday through like 350, which is like a massive, uh, like a level. And this like Amazon was making a new high yesterday and it's not really selling off hard today. Yeah. So, I mean, this was fascinating. It's like, there's all this geopolitical angst and I'm like, wow, like this thing is still pretty powerful in the short term, right? Like I'm, that longer term inflationary stuff will, will hurt big tech eventually. But like, this looks pretty constructive to me. In fact, like it, it looks similar to like Bitcoin, yeah. like a, a consolidation of a month or two. And if you get like volatility just dropping or, nothing crazier happening this will probably keep going i mean this yeah. is quinn i know you've been tracking etf flows pretty closely and might have a slightly different view on bitcoin short term uh what do you think there yeah i i i think my general take i i'm not super strong in in either direction i'm, I'm not ragingly bullish uh 
one thing I'd, I'd be curious if you guys have views on on the Hong Kong ETFs. I haven't gotten a good answer from anyone what that's going to actually mean. Most people, it might be a nothing burger. It might be something. Um, my view is just generally speaking, we've had flows slow, both ETF uh, inflows, ETF trading volumes, and stablecoin inflows. And none of those should be used as leading indicators or, or even coincident in the very short term, right? Like those are things you want to be looking at over multi-month time periods usually. And, and so think different things can happen, but you have that dynamic, which, which kind of coupled with this huge boom post launch of the ETFs, like some digestion, right? Like I, it's positive. We haven't seen outflows from, from the IBIT and FBTC, the two big ones like that. That's a very good sign to me. Um, I kind of don't care about GBTC as much because I just think over time that's of less importance and it's largely noise how we get between where we're at today and and when those assets eventually stabilize or come out. But you couple the slowdown with momentum with uh, the halving next week, which, you know, these big events in crypto tend to be sell the news is... I, I don't know what the number is of people that bought Bitcoin to front run the halving, but it's not zero. It might be very small, and and you can someone might take the view that it's it's a such a telegraphed event now that you know people don't really try and front run it anymore. Um, but I, I think there's something there in terms of like the ETF being you know it was a, a bit of a sell the news, and then the macro just getting dicier. Like as much as us in crypto want to say that Bitcoin is is cemented as digital gold it's still you know not viewed by the the broader community quite yet as this gold like stand you know store of value that that can be kind of a rock in in you know global co conflict which i think over time it gets there but so i'm just a little more hesitant like i'm 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 waiting for a, a fatter pitch here i'm i'm not uh mm -hmm. let, me, let me play devil's advocate with that. yeah i don't disagree with you because there we go so right you guys are deep in the crypto world and more in the, the you know old school Wall Street world per se. I haven't gotten one email from a broker that has talked about the having. Maybe 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 BTIG is like the only one that or can't canter canter and BTIG mm -hmm. kind of like mm -hmm. cover cover it a little bit. But like and JP Morgan put a, a piece out last week on on the having. But besides that, like none of them are talking about it. None mm -hmm. of them. So I'm I'm very curious, like where, and not only that, but think about the, so Larry Fink, fastest growing ETF in history for him. He's put like zero marketing dollars behind it yet. Like I don't see commercials about any of this stuff. Like it ever doesn't really hit the mainstream. I don't think. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not getting the texts from my you know mother in law saying, hey, should I buy some Bitcoin? Like. <laughs> So to me, like I, I, from that perspective, I don't think it's going to be a sell the news. The, the only reason what it would be is, you know, these geopolitics unwind here. And I, I think there's a reason to sell the news and real rates skyrocket and risk gets taken down. Yeah. That, that, I mean, that's kind of what I've, I've just, that's been a big in, uh, influence in my views is this, like no one's really trying to reach too far out the, the risk curve, but I, I, I agree. I should also clarify, like, I'm of the view that that the floor and in, in for Bitcoin is much higher than other assets given the ETF impact. And so my favorite expression when I'm I'm getting defensive is is often longing Bitcoin and and uh not longing uh other assets. So mm -hmm. I, I do agree that that for Bitcoin it's kind of a more insulated uh than than a lot of the other alts and things. Yeah, I think relative to mainstream, we're definitely still relatively early in terms of awareness of what's occurring. I mean, Tyler, quick question for you: When you hear from these uh, more traditional guys, like, do any of them do any of them know that Coinbase has its own layer two called Base, where they're just no. racking up millions of dollars of fees every month? I mean, no, 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 no. like none of them. <laughs> my 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 pushback though to that is like we're. I don't think we should. I don't think we should benchmark the 2021 environment to, to this year because hmm. that was you could throw a blindfolded dart at the wall and every asset you possibly could touch was going to 10x, and that was just a different helicopter money, zero interest rate type of environment where if rates are at five, six, like I don't think Bitcoin needs to do poorly. 
I think Bitcoin's different and can do well, but I think it it's a more uphill battle for for a lot of the more speculative assets in the in the ecosystem. I I, I think, and and retail, you know, I just don't know. I think there needs to be a, a market change in in the macro or something uh, to get retail back to that um, that place they were in twenty one. Totally. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Can we get well, we'll some see. artwork for Felix's uh, room? <laughs> know, it's a little sad. It's just like, it looks like I'm just cornered by doors. Very Tyler, you, you should have your kids, you should have your kids, uh, yeah. you know, send, we'll give you our addresses and have your kids paint us some. some for yeah. Yeah, well, we'll I, need, I need a big plant here too. That'll, that'll happen. Yeah. I'm going to do some renovations Bruce here. We got yeah. Bruce Springsteen for you. Maybe Mike will give you his, <laughs> the dead plant that, that he had to ship out of his. Yeah. I can bring it back. I have a green thumb. Yeah. Good. They're all just hiding in my living room, but I'll bring them in here for the for the next time. <laughs> it's good for the air you breathe. Awesome, sure. guys. Well, uh, no, Felix, it's been fun. And uh, yeah, definitely totally. look forward to seeing you more on here. Absolutely. And hope everybody has a nice weekend. Hey, guys. Likewise.